starts right now. We begin tonight with an update on the latest coronavirus numbers here in Bear County. Officials announcing tonight we have 2,840 new cases. For two consecutive days, we've had daily cases reaching nearly 3,000. Our total confirmed cases right now sits at 146,343. Our seven day moving average is now 2,261. That is the highest it has been since the pandemic began. Six new deaths tonight, also bringing the death toll now to 1,716. As for hospitalization rates, 1,394 people are hospitalized. Hospitalized. That is up seven since yesterday. 424 people are in the ICU, which is up 21 since yesterday. And 241 people are on ventilators. Meanwhile, phone lines to get the Moderna vaccine through WellMed will reopen tomorrow beginning at 8 a.m. WellMed officials say they received hundreds of thousands of calls today. We'd had 380,000 attempts on the line. I will tell you, keep trying. Uh, the phone number is how you schedule the appointment. And so the phone line is open. If you get that it's been disconnected, that's because your cell phone carrier has told the call to be dropped. Lots of viewers frustrated by trying to get through there. WellMed officials say slots for Monday and some of Tuesday already filled. However, there are still openings for the rest of the week. The Elvira Cisneros Senior Center Activity Center is limited to 1,000 appointments a day, and the Alicia Trevino Lopez Senior One Stop Center is 500 per day. The number to make an appointment is on your screen, 833-968-1745. And on your screen now, we're showing you who's eligible to get either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Those eligible in phase 1A of the distribution include health care workers and nursing home residents. Phase 1B includes people 65 years and older and people 16 years and older with at least one chronic medical condition like diabetes, cancer, heart conditions, and even pregnancy, just to name a few. A note for the Moderna vaccine, you have to be at least 18 or older to receive it. In North Texas, Dallas County Health and Human Services confirming a third case of COVID-19 variant tonight. According to that agency, a Dallas man in his 20s with no history of travel outside of the U.S. has tested positive for the U.K. variant. Texas is just one of several states with at least one known case of the new variant. State health officials say the vaccine is still expected to be effective. Officials with the Department of State Health Services says Texas will have more than 333,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine next week. The announcement was made today and they will be delivered to 260 different vaccine providers, including some here in Bear County. We have not been made aware yet of how many doses will be available locally. That was a lot of information. All of it you can find right now on our website, like the latest update on doses, the full list of medical conditions that are required to be eligible, and much more, just head over to our website at ksat.com. The inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden is now just days away, but the investigation into last week's wild riot at the Capitol continues to dominate the news. The FBI is still looking for people involved, and now some Texans are feeling the heat. The night team's Jonathan Cotto reports local leaders are looking for anyone from this area who may have been involved, and that includes people in law enforcement. It's been more than a week since the Capitol was met with a day that will forever live in the nation's memory. What was initially considered to be a peaceful protest soon turned to chaos as those involved took their protests to the Capitol and took it by storm. Now widespread investigations are underway and the FBI continues to make arrests. The identity of those involved have begun to surface. And this week, the troubles hit home in Texas. Houston's police chief identified one officer involved and said 18-year veteran Tam Din Pam, who was a participant in the riots, and took the Capitol on his off time, has been since relieved of duty. In light of the massive investigation, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg says he has already looked into the possibility of any involvement by San Antonio Police Department personnel. I inquired about that with our city manager. There is no information that links any of our uh, city law enforcement to the activities that were happening on January 6th. If that did occur and information is brought to, uh, brought to us, 
um, then there will be a full internal investigation and, and, and serious consequences. The local FBI has placed billboards around the city asking for any information on San Antonians who may have been involved in the Capitol riot. As of this week, 70 arrests have been made. According to acting U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, authorities have opened 170 investigations. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And a Bear County Sheriff's Office lieutenant is currently under investigation both criminally and administratively after posting multiple photographs on Facebook showing her near the U.S. Capitol on the day of that attack. A fire this morning claiming the life of a San Antonio woman, making her the first fire-related fatality of the year. The San Antonio Fire Department tonight still trying to figure out the cause of that fire at the home located off of Callahan Road. The night team's Jaffney Gray tells us what neighbors had to say to the now mourning family. It's just sad. It's a sad, 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 sad day for their family. Residents in this northwest side neighborhood in shock after learning one of their very own was killed in a morning fire. At first, I didn't know what was going on, but then we found out that there was a fire in the home, so we were just concerned about our neighbors. It happened around 930 at this home on Callahan Road, which, as you can see by the look of it, sustained minimal damage. The San Antonio Fire Department would soon learn the damage done is far beyond the structure of the house. Other members of the family or other occupants of this home were elsewhere. They did come back once the fire was active, and so that's why we didn't really know where this person was. After knocking down the fire, which originated in a back bedroom, officials say that is where they found the victim, a woman in her 30s. And she uh, was definitely deceased uh, in that fire room of origin. Um, no, no chance for us for a transport or anything of that nature. At this time, the fire is still under investigation. Neighbors had this to say to the family who is now dealing with the first fire-related fatality of 2021. Reach out. We, we can definitely, we're here to support our community and help them out, whatever they need. Japhany Gray, KSAT 12 News. Well, a man is facing multiple charges following an hours-long standoff with San Antonio police. 38-year-old Michael McGee is now in custody. He was booked today on three felony warrants, including aggravated robbery, unauthorized use of a vehicle, and possessing a controlled substance. Yesterday's standoff happened at the Churchill Estates neighborhood. McGee barricaded himself inside his apartment for more than seven hours. He's accused of entering a home with his girlfriend two nights ago and robbing a 72-year-old disabled man and his 50-year-old daughter. After the standoff, police did a search and found the handgun used in the robbery and the victim's stolen property. Taking a look now at other stories we've been following today, San Antonio police say they're hoping surveillance video may help them find at least two suspects who they say opened fire on two teens over on the northwest side tonight. Police say the teens were crossing Snowden Road near Babcock early this evening when a vehicle approached. Two people in that vehicle allegedly firing off several shots, striking a 16-year-old in the abdomen and a ricocheted bullet apparently hit an 18-year-old in the neck. Both teens called for help while near a Subway restaurant where someone helped tend to their wounds. Those teens are expected to recover. San Antonio police looking for three suspects in connection with a stabbing that left one man in critical condition. The incident happened just after two this morning on St. Mary's and Convent Streets. Police say an altercation between the four men led to the stabbing. The man was later found next to his vehicle with a stab wound to the abdomen and was taken to Bamsey. Police believe the suspects left in a dark colored vehicle. A mother and son without a home tonight after their home caught fire twice in one day. This incident happened in the 200 block of Goodwin. The first fire happened around 7 p.m. Friday with only the sun inside the home. Fire crews quickly put out that fire, but by midnight, flames were seen coming from the home again, this time with no one inside. Arson investigators believe the fires were set intentionally. That home deemed a total loss. Tomorrow morning on Leading SA, we're joined by Renee Watson. That's the MLK Commission Chair because Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Due to the pandemic, this year's march is all virtual. We'll be discussing the event and how organizers felt it was important to still honor Dr. King. If you have any questions you'd like asked, submit them right now on the Leading SA section at ksat.com. Hey there, outside with live cam tonight, a 
Chilly night down to 50 at the airport. Clear skies after a beautiful clear day. Uh, like the past couple of days, really the only thing we could complain about today was the very high mountain cedar count. Hopefully that number will go down a bit by tomorrow. Uh, at the airport now we're actually reading 46. North north winds are light. Our air is very, very dry. So temperatures will bottom out in the low to mid 30s again tonight. So we'll be off to a cold start uh, tomorrow morning, but really all in all, Tomorrow will be another very nice day with plenty of sunshine. A few more clouds roll in uh, on the holiday Monday, but rain chances hold off until after the long weekend. They kick in on Tuesday. We will talk about these chances of much needed rain coming up in just a few minutes. A father shot by police in front of his family. See the video and why the family says they never wanted police to show up to begin with. Plus, 2 million people around the world have died from COVID-19. How this devastating milestone comes as the U.S. is still struggling to get the virus under control. And planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. It is the mindset over on Capitol Hill as they get ready for President-elect Biden's inauguration this week. We have the latest on the increased security around the nation's capital. Well, with the inauguration day just four days away, security has never been tighter. Yeah, federal authorities warning of a substantial threat after the riots at the Capitol as investigators continue to make arrests for and their search for rioters. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. The nation on high alert, the streets of D.C. deserted, instead flooded with law enforcement, barricades and fences. By Wednesday, 25,000 National Guard members expected, five times the number of American troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Our mission here is to protect our people and our property, and so we're going to do everything to make sure that they're successful. A Virginia man arrested at a D.C. checkpoint with an unauthorized inauguration credential. Police say he had a loaded handgun and 500 rounds of ammunition. He was charged with a single count of carrying a pistol without a license and was later released. The FBI concerned about possible improvised explosive devices and the ongoing threat to political leaders, saying the Capitol siege likely emboldened extremists. Four bridges into the city will be closed. Much of the National Mall also shut down. I don't know if anyone has raised their hand to say we are coming, we will be there, but we are preparing as if they are. At least 10 states activating their National Guard troops, some Capitol buildings now boarded up. Michigan legislators suspending session next week over credible threats. Tensions so high across the country, this reported bomb scare near an FBI building in Seattle drawing a heavy police presence Saturday night. New details continue to emerge from that violent insurrection. The Washington Post reporting three days before an internal Capitol Police Intelligence report warned that Congress could be the target of angry Trump supporters. Authorities now working to determine whether lawmakers assisted rioters by giving building tours the day before. Coast to coast manhunts underway for suspects. Far right media personality Tim Gianette, who calls himself Baked Alaska, arrested in Texas Saturday, allegedly spotted on video inside the Capitol chanting, Patriots are in control. The Department of Justice opening nearly 300 investigations related to the riots. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Back here at home, really couldn't have asked for a more beautiful Saturday. I know. I mean, our winter is looking so beautiful. I was thinking yeah. about over in D.C., Katie. I know we were just talking about this. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be nicer there next yes. week than this year. Yes, so things look pretty good uh, for Inauguration Day in D.C. Certainly it will be cold up there, 30s in the morning, climbing into just the low 40s in the afternoon. Got this cool graphic here. It'll be breezy there. North Northwest winds 10 to 20 miles per hour, but mostly sunny skies. So rain shouldn't be an issue for Inauguration Day there. Now, different story here at home. By midweek uh, next week, we're talking about rain chances, showers and storms for us here in South Texas. A very welcome change for us because we really need some rain. Pretty much all of the KSAP viewing area is under some sort of drought. So rain is a good thing and we've got chances kicking in uh, in just a couple more days. The reason for uh, the rain chances coming in a nice change in our weather pattern or the steering flow. The winds in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere by the middle of next week. We're talking about a cutoff low pressure system uh, sitting over Baja California, just south of California there. This is going to hang out for a couple of days, toss 
also some moisture and some rain making energy. So that's why we'll see rain chances kick in on Tuesday. And as this hangs out for a few days next week, our rain chances will actually linger through the end of next work and school week. So they'll kick in on Tuesday and we'll have a chance of rain showers and storms in the forecast through the end of next week. It does look like Friday that rain chance will be early in the day and then we'll clear out in the afternoon and and then rain chances are out of the forecast by the start of next weekend. But looks like we'll be able to cash in on uh, some decent rainfall next week. So some good things coming over the next couple of days. But uh, the rest of the long weekend will be pretty pleasant. So if you need to spend some time outdoors, you'll have an opportunity to do that tomorrow and again on Monday. 46 at the airport now. Our air is very, very dry. Dew points are in the 20s. Our winds are light with clear skies for now. Uh, that's a good recipe to cool down very efficiently and quickly again tonight. Uh, but as we look at satellite and radar, you'll notice some clouds and even a little bit of precipitation showing up off to the northwest, still kind of north of the hill country. It does look like we're getting some clouds working into a portion of Real and Edwards counties, even into northern Gillespie County now. So we've got a little batch of clouds here that is going to continue to work southeast overnight. Now, since our air is so dry, not just at the surface, but also up a little bit higher in the atmosphere. Uh, I'm not expecting any rain to fall out of these clouds tonight. If there's a few sprinkles here or there, stranger things would have happened, and it does look like our radar site is picking up on a little bit of precipitation here. So I can't rule out a little sprinkle overnight, but generally speaking, we're just looking at this patch of clouds uh, moving in through the overnight hours. So partly cloudy while most of us are sleeping tonight, but by early tomorrow morning, those clouds will be out of here and we're looking at plenty of sunshine uh, across the area to round out uh, the weekend tomorrow. And then again on Monday still should uh, be a pleasant day Monday, but Monday is kind of our transition day. That's when I think we'll start to see some more consistent cloud cover. And Monday is also when we'll start to see a little rebound in our humidity. Nonetheless, should be a fairly warm day, comfortable uh, with high temperatures in the upper 60s and low 70s. But again, I mentioned our transition day Monday. That's when our winds will really settle in out of the south. That will start to bring in some moisture at the surface. So our dew points will climb during the day Monday. And by Tuesday through the back half of next week, when we've got those rain chances in the forecast, uh, it will feel a bit muggy. But we do need the bugginess to support the rainfall. So not all bad news there. Again, rain chances kick in Tuesday. Scattered showers and storms possible uh, next week. Slightly lower coverage of rain Thursday. It looks like our best bet will be late Thursday, early Friday. Now, just how much rain are we talking? I'll have those rainfall estimates for you coming up next half hour. Guys, thank you so much, Katie. Mm -hmm. All right, the Spurs split a pair with the Rockets at home. Uh, that's right. They lost their, their last game against them in kind of brutal fashion. Some tough plays in the fourth quarter tonight. They were on the right end of those fourth quarter plays, and we come back and show you all the highlights about how they got it done, including the slam from DeJounte Murray. Plus, in a matchup of ranked teams across the nation, Baylor knocks off Tech. Got those highlights as well. Next. Same opponent, a couple nights later, Spurs taking on the Rockets for the second time in three days at the AT&T Center. First quarter, San Antonio takes control. DeJounte Murray gets the layup to fall, count it, and one. He missed the free throw, but the Spurs still lead 6-3. Rockets respond with a 12-0 run. Christian Wood gets that to go, plus the foul, and suddenly the Spurs trail 15-8. They say in striking distance, thanks to Jakob Pertl, the big man scoring three buckets inside. He's the first of the Spurs to double figures today, but San Antonio trails 30-21 after one. So we head to the second, and here comes San Antonio. First off a wild play. Murray finds DeMar DeRozan cutting baseline for the hoop. No call there. Then with under two minutes to play, Devin Vassell drives and hits the floater. San Antonio comes back to tie it up at 50, but Mason Jones calls his own number from distance, and the Rockets head into halftime with a 53-50 lead. Let's pick it up in the third quarter. Spurs vault ahead. Keldon Johnson, the Mustang, driving inside, flips it up and in. San Antonio goes up by four. Then in the final minute of the frame, Patty Mills finds Murray at the top of the arc, and he drains it. Spurs go up 75-72, heading into the fourth quarter. Game still in doubt, though, until midway through the final frame. DeRozan finds Keldon Johnson on the wing. That's good. 90 to 83 Spurs. And that's when Murray takes over. First, more ball movement. Finds Murray in pretty much the same spot, and that drops in. Spurs with their largest lead of the game up by 10. Timeout Houston. And then with three and a half to play, Murray comes up with a steal. And he's going to finish on the other end with a one-handed jam. He's got a double-double. 18 points, 10 rebounds. DeRozan has a team-high 24. Spurs get a big win, 103 to 91. They just fought both games, you know. They got his last game, this game. They was fighting, fighting, fighting. And 
We just kept preaching, must win, must win, must win, must win, whatever it takes. We just focused on our defense, especially in the fourth quarter. We really dialed it in, and we, we didn't let them um, get the paint as easily, and, and that's really what won us the game. Next up, Spurs will hit the road to face the Trailblazers Monday at 2 p.m. Longhorns men's basketball looking to right the ship after a tough loss at home to Texas Tech early in the week, taking on Kansas State tonight. Texas strikes early and often. Check out the ball pressure here, forcing the turnover. Andrew Jones gets the steal and the two. 16-12 Longhorns. Then off the miss, Jericho Sims is there for the follow slam. Texas goes up 32-15, and they're not done. Courtney Ramey draws contact and just throws it up and in. Count it plus the foul. Longhorns lead 44-24 at halftime. They win it 82-67. Two of the best teams in the nation meet in Lubbock today. Number two, Baylor against number 15, Texas Tech. First half, all Bears off the turnover. Davion Mitchell throws down the two-handed slam, and Baylor jumps out to a commanding 11-3 lead. And in the final minute of the half, Matthew Mayer drains the triple, so the Bears head into halftime of 26-18. But the Red Raiders open the second half with a 16-8 run. Mac McClung drills his own three ball, and Tech jumps ahead 40 to 38. But Baylor pulls away late. Adam Flagler for three. He's got it. Baylor wins a hard-fought game, 68 to 60. In high school hoops, good matchup at Littleton Gym this afternoon between a pair of two and one teams. Clark taking on Reagan in District 28-6A. Picked up in the fourth quarter. Rattlers hanging tough, and they swing it around the perimeter to Keith Davis, who drains the triple from the wing. Davis finished with a game-high 30 points, but the Cougars proved too much down the stretch. Jordan Mason gets to his spot and knocks down the jumper. Two of his team-high 23 points. The Cougars improved to 3-1 and one in district with an 80-63 victory. It feels really good. We know um, Reagan's always a tough game for us. It's always competitive, so it feels good to get a win over it. Our, our team did amazing. Every guy that stepped on the court contributed, and then we're just hoping to carry this momentum through the rest of the district. Super excited. I'm super excited. I'm just happy that we've been able to have a winning season for all of our seniors. We have big aspirations, so beating a tough team like Reagan's always good for us. All right, next up, the Cougars will take on Roosevelt on Wednesday night at Paul Taylor Fieldhouse. Coming up later in sports, an update on Dak Prescott. He's, he's, he tries to come back from a brutal leg injury. Signs looking good, guys. All right, we'll see you in the second half. You got it. We'll be right back. Stay with us. It's hard to grieve when there's still an officer walking the streets that, that killed my father. It was a mental distress call in Killeen, Texas, that ended in the shooting death of a 52-year-old father. And now Patrick Warren's family is speaking out for the first time about their call for help that day. And the whole incident was caught on camera. Take a look. A ring doorbell camera captures the chaos and soon a family's heartache when a Killeen, Texas police officer called to their home, shot 52-year-old Patrick Warren Sr., who family members say was in mental crisis. My father, you know, he was outside and uh, he was praising to the sky, you know, he was, he was saying different things like hallelujah, but he was super loud. We couldn't get him inside and we're like, okay, something's going on. We need to alert somebody. Family members say after they called the city's mental health hotline, a lone police officer now identified as Reynaldo Contreras arrived at the scene. We had no idea they were sending out a police officer. In the video, you can see Contreras walk into the house. Moments later, he comes back out. Then Warren comes out of his home, walks toward the officer, waving his arms in the air. He appears unarmed. You can hear family members urging police not to shoot. Hey, you're not shooting. Family and friends come into view as Warren and the officer are moving away from the house. The shaky cell phone video captures what happens next. The sounds of the stun device followed by gunshots. Hey, Dad, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Please. No, I told you don't use a gun. The officer shot Warren three times as his mother, wife, and sons watched from the porch. The family's attorney says the situation last Sunday should not have ended this way. He showed up alone. He showed up untrained. He showed up hostile. All those things made for a deadly sort of cocktail, and this, this result could have completely been avoided. The Killeen Police Department says Officer Contreras is a five-year veteran. He's now on administrative leave pending the results of this investigation. The U.S. now on track to reach 400,000 COVID-19 deaths. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. This comes as more than 2 million people have died globally. 
so far here in the new year in the U.S. has seen more than 3 million new cases and more than 100,000 cases logged every day since November 3rd. Multiple states now have more vaccine appointments than doses available. Some hospitals like New York's Mount Sinai canceling reservations as they worry about a lack of supply. President-elect Joe Biden is planning to sign about a dozen executive orders on his first day in office. This according to his incoming chief of staff, Ron Klain. Biden plans to have the U.S. rejoin the Paris Climate Accord and to rescind the travel ban on predominantly Muslim countries. He also intends to address the pandemic by halting evictions and student loan payments and mandating masks on federal property. As for legislation, Biden is sending Congress a $1.9 trillion pandemic relief bill. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will pay tribute to past and present trailblazers when she takes her oath of office on Wednesday. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor will swear her in. Sotomayor is the high court's first Hispanic member and only its third female. Harris will use a Bible that belonged to Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American Supreme Court Justice. The incoming vice president herself making history by being the first black, South Asian and female to hold that office. Still ahead on the night beat, we take a look at how your mental health is affected as we enter a second year of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of us were happy to leave the year 2020 behind, but a brand new year doesn't mean a clean slate, of course, when it comes to COVID. Yeah, we've all been living with the reality of the pandemic for 10 months now, believe it or not. Feels like longer sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the stress is leaving very few of us unscathed. It was the topic of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. Myra Arthur tells us a little bit more about why she thought this was an important topic to cover. We are coming up on one year living in this pandemic, and we have all spent so much of this last year facing challenges that we never could have expected before March of 2020 and challenges that we're still adjusting to. And we've spent the last year so focused on our own physical health, trying not to get COVID, trying to make sure that we're washing our hands, we're wearing our mask, we're keeping our distance. But all of that has, no matter your situation, had an effect on our mental health as well. Change is hard. Change is hard under any circumstance, but it's especially hard when it's done immediately, like we all had to quickly shift back in the spring of 2020. And then when it's done, when we don't really understand exactly what's going on and living under the risk that we've all been living with for roughly the last year, all of that pressure is mounting on people. It's mounting on adults, it's mounting on kids. We've all been living with these changes and these challenges. And so we wanted to take a look at what's happening to our mental health. What has the toll on our mental well-being been over the last year? We're in 2021 and I wanted to take a look at this. I wanted to do focus on this topic of mental health uh, as an episode of KSAT Explains because I noticed it in my own life. I have felt the pressure of it. I have felt the anxiety of living with uh, the stress of the normal things we do every day now being risky, the grocery store, a restaurant, seeing a friend, gathering with family. And I started to notice it in just talking to my friends. We're trying to stay connected so everyone is texting and, and calling each other on the phone instead of seeing each other face to face. And it was almost as if when one person started talking about how the last year has been incredibly challenging in ways we never expected, it was a waterfall of conversation. Conversation. Uh, everyone started sharing just different aspects of the, the tough situations they found themselves in that none of us knew about. And it was incredibly helpful to share that. So I hope that in this episode of KSAT Explains, we look ahead to what's on the horizon in this pandemic and ways that we can meet those challenges and take care of ourselves at the same time. Another look outside with live cam on this chilly evening. Skies are mostly clear for now, but we've got a batch of clouds sitting just north of the hill country 
those will move through overnight tonight. Nonetheless, we're still going to start off in the mid to upper 30s tomorrow morning, but you'll notice our morning low temperatures heading into next week. They start to get a bit warmer, low 60s, upper 50s by Tuesday and Wednesday. So some weather changes on the way. Uh, we'll talk about our change in temperatures and rain chances coming up. You start. <laughs> what are y'all arguing about? <laughs> okay, so Tim can't stand it when millennials or anybody puts eggs, cracks eggs on anything that isn't breakfast, like it burgers. Have to be millennials. That's just not my thing. I'm yeah, like, well, I'm saying the millennial thing. I was more complaining I didn't know how to use Instagram, and then she took a video of me, so. <laughs> just <laughs> wait, you guys. There. It's Gerber Gold. <laughs> You guys, you guys handle take that. The weather. We'll talk about. We'll talk about. I'm gonna go weather. cook some eggs and put it on some burgers. <laughs> now we're cooking with gas. This is good. Good conversation. Keep I'm hungry lively. now. I'm hungry. Keep it lively. <laughs> uh, beautiful day today. We've got more sunshine on the way tomorrow, but by Tuesday, rain chances kick in, and that's good news because we really need some rain here. A really nice day today. If you don't count the cedar count, which was very high count of over 13,000. Hopefully, because it wasn't so breezy today, that cedar count will come down a little bit tomorrow. But of course, we're still smack dab in the middle of mountain cedar season. So expect it to just be an issue through about early February. That's when we really start to get those numbers down. Uh, today at the airport, 33 in the morning low up to 65 this afternoon. Very comfortable out there with low humidity. Temperatures now falling into the 40s. We've got some 30s up in the hill country, uh, even some 50s off to the southwest, 50 in Catula 51 in Del Rio right now. I mentioned we've got a batch of clouds moving in from the northwest. This is a little piece of upper level moisture and energy. Uh, this is mainly just going to be some clouds, but radar is picking up on a little bit of very light precipitation now in, Nord in northern Edwards County, uh, extending just north of Fredericksburg and Gillespie County there. Now our atmosphere is very dry from the ground all the way up through the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. Uh, so any of this precipitation likely will evaporate before it makes it to the ground. Nonetheless, I can't rule out maybe a little sprinkle here or there, but this is not going to be measurable rainfall or anything like that. But we'll see this batch of clouds move through overnight. So partly cloudy skies, temperatures falling into the upper 30s by about 4 a.m. We should land right around 36 here in San Antonio tomorrow morning. I can't rule out a brief light freeze up in the hill country early tomorrow, but no widespread freeze tonight because we've got that little batch of clouds moving through. Uh, that'll help to keep temperatures from falling down as much as they would if skies were clear. 62 at Lunchtime tomorrow, 68 or high temperature. Another nice day. Winds west southwest, just 5 to 10 miles per hour. Look ahead to your Monday. Monday should also be a pretty quiet day weather wise. High temperature near 70, but we should see some more clouds rolling in on Monday. I wouldn't be surprised if we start off mostly cloudy Monday morning and then turn partly cloudy in the afternoon. Wind direction southerly by Monday afternoon, 10 to 20 miles per hour, so a touch breezy, and that will start to pump in moisture at the surface by Tuesday. We will be quite muggy, and it'll stay that way for the rest of the week. Uh, that goes hand in hand with a change in our weather pattern that will lend itself to some chances of rain. So by Tuesday and Wednesday, a piece of the jet stream will become cut off over uh, Southern California there. This is what we call a cutoff low because it's removed from the rest of the jet stream. As that sits there, it is going to toss us some rain making energy and some moisture. So that's why we see rain chances jump into the forecast Tuesday and continue through the end of next work and school week. Right now, it looks like our best chance highest coverage of rain should come late Thursday into Friday, but even Tuesday into Wednesday, a scattering of some showers and storms doesn't look like any widespread severe weather at this time, but certainly can't rule out some rumbles of thunder uh, as we get into next week. But what it's really looking like here is some beneficial rainfall for us. So over the next seven days through next Saturday evening, again, we've got those rain chances Tuesday through Friday. Uh, estimated rainfall totals have gone up over the past 24 hours or so. We're looking at a more widespread uh, one to two inches of rain possible. And even where you see the purple here, generally north of Highway 90, uh, maybe some isolated totals more than two inches of rain. And again, this is good because we've got a widespread drought situation uh, across the KSAT 12 viewing area in South Texas with just a couple of exceptions. So this rain comes at a very good time for us. Maybe a touch inconvenient at times during next week, especially considering school and everything like that. Uh, but just keep in mind, it won't be raining all day, every day. So rain coming in, uh, we will take it. That's for sure, guys. So we won't talk about avocado toast, I guess. <laughs> I'm a plain man, a very plain man. <laughs> eat, your, eat your eggs for breakfast. All right, let's talk about Dak and his leg. He's feeling better, huh? That's a great segue, Tim. Uh, <laughs>
Uh, yes, Dak is feeling a lot better when we come back. We've got an update on how he's doing, especially after that terrible injury he suffered this season. Got all the details on the latest on Dak Prescott's status. Plus, some divisional round highlights as the NFL heats up. Got those next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good news for Cowboys fans eager to see number four back under center. Quarterback Dak Prescott is making great progress in his recovery. NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport reported that Prescott is walking, working on an anti-gravity gravity treadmill, and in a hydro works pool. So he's staying in shape without putting pressure on his ankle. It's been three months since Dak suffered his season ending ankle injury, and the Cowboys have continually said that Dak is their future. There is still the ongoing contract dispute, though. Dak played under the franchise tag in 2020. Things are not so positive in Houston. Star quarterback Deshaun Watson reportedly wants out of the Texans organization. Multiple, multiple reports excuse me, say that Watson is upset with team owner Cal McNair for not fulfilling his promise and consulting him before hiring Nick Casario as general manager. The Texans also have not even interviewed two of the head coaching candidates Watson was most interested in. Robert Sala, who was hired by the Jets this week, and Eric Bieniemy, who is the offensive coordinator of the Chiefs, who has yet to decide on his future. McNair, meanwhile, has said that he wants Watson in the loop for hiring the next head coach. Time will tell if they can repair what looks to be a fractured relationship. The NFL Divisional Round kicks off in historic Lambeau Field. Number one offense against number one defense. Top-seeded Packers hosting the six-seeded Rams. Aaron Rodgers likely the MVP, showing why in the second quarter. Scrambling, pump faking, and slipping past the pylon for the touchdown. Green Bay leads 19-10 at the break. Second half, they stay hot. Opening possession, Aaron Jones backs his way in for the one-yard score. Pack threatening to run away with it now, up 25-10. L.A. responds late in the third. Cam Akers takes the direct snap and knifes his way into the end zone. Rams get the two-point conversion to make it a seven-point game. But here come the Pack. Fourth quarter, off play action. Rodgers uncorks the deep ball and hits Alan Lazard in stride for the 58-yard touchdown. That'll do it. Pack will host the NFC Championship game with a 32-18 victory over the Rams. So happy for our guys. Um, definitely a little emotional. Uh, just thinking about what we've been through. Um, got me emotional with the crowd out there today. I'm just still really happy about everything that happened tonight. In the nightcap, Ravens at the Bills, third quarter, Baltimore down 10 to 3. Lamar Jackson sees a window that isn't there. Taron Johnson picks him off in the end zone, and he takes off down the sidelines. No one's going to catch him. A 101 yard pick six. Buffalo is moving on to the AFC Championship game, 17 to 3. Shifting gears a bit now, tennis fans hoping for some normalcy with this year's Australian Open are a little out of luck. 47 tennis players have been forced into quarantine after a pair of passengers on two charter planes to Melbourne tested positive for COVID-19. Fortunately, none of the players themselves tested positive, but they will not be allowed to leave their hotel rooms for 14 days until they are medically cleared. They also won't be eligible to practice, so this could have a massive impact on the outcome of the tournament. Here at home, San Antonio is hosting some of the best swimmers in the nation this week for the Tier Pro Swim Series. Olympic gold medalists like Lily King and Ryan Murphy have dazzled so far, winning their signature events in breaststroke and backstroke, respectively, all with no fans in the stands. Without the roar of the crowd to cheer them on, is it tough getting up for a race against some stiff competition? This is a meet where, where you've got to swim tough and, and figure out how to, how to manufacture that energy yourself. And, uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do. And so that's that's something that's uh, it is a little bit unique, but you know we're we're working through it and and uh, and learning how to do that as as well as possible. The meet wraps up tomorrow with eight events. Prelims start in the morning at 9 a.m. and finals start at 6 p.m. And one quick tidbit for Mr. Browns fan Tim Gerber. I just saw this online. Yes. The Browns, for the first time since 1989, are the last AFC North team standing in the playoffs. So congratulations. For now. For now. Yes. <laughs> they do play tomorrow. Thank you. I'll be watching. <laughs> you got it. We'll be right back. I learned how to use Instagram, but here's something else that's good tonight. This is, that was the best thing, but this is also a really good thing. After the Dallas resident, Frank Miller, his wife, Alicia, brought him a book all about baseball pitching. He became, as she described in her words, obsessed. So Alice, needing to find her husband a new friend to play catch with, went to the next door app, 76 responses later, they had enough people to start their own baseball team. Awesome. Frank says he is grateful for the sense of community. Love baseball. Pitchers and catchers report soon. <laughs> that is yeah. amazing. Spring training, spring training soon. Uh, nice the next couple of days. Monday is when things will start to change, but showers and storms don't kick in until Tuesday, and they'll be with us through the end of next work and school week. A few lucky yards could see close to two inches of rain by the end of next week. Good stuff there, guys. 
look for Courtney's Instagram to see her make fun of me. <laughs> That's all our time for tonight. It's so good, you guys. We'll see you tomorrow.